Hey everyone, it's Eric. Today's show on China-Africa relations with Tobia Shodi is a great example of how confusing, complicated, and even contradictory China-Africa relations is today. And things now are moving so fast with COVID-19 changing pretty much everything. So staying up to date with all that's going on is now so much more difficult, and that's why we started our new daily China-Africa email newsletter. If you're a journalist, an analyst, a practitioner, or just someone who's interested in Chinese international relations, you should definitely give it a try. It's free for the first two weeks. Try it out. See if you like it. Go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Oh, and by the way, use the promo code podcast at checkout, and we're going to give you a really big discount. And if you're a student or a teacher, well, it's always half off. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, today we're going to touch on Nigeria-China relations, and this is, in my view, the most interesting relationship right now in the broader China-Africa engagement. It is absolutely fascinating to be watched, to watch what's been happening there over the past two or three months. Uh, we have a fascinating guest today, and before we get to the guest to talk about why things are happening and where we are right now in this pivotal relationship, I'd like to kind of bring everybody back to early April, and I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the key milestones that have led to, again, a pivotal turning point, what I think, in China-Africa relations and specifically in China-Nigeria relations. Let's go back to April 8th. And that was when uh, the Nigerian Consul General in Guangzhou, Razak Lawal, he, you know, his video, he confronted Chinese officials at the height of when everything was happening and unfolding on the streets of Guangzhou, uh, challenging Chinese discrimination against Africans, the forced eviction of, Ch of Africans and Nigerians uh, on the streets. And a video of him confronting a Chinese official sparked and went viral very, very quickly. Let's listen to what he had to say. If you want your policy to work, mm -hmm. I'm suggesting to you this night, yeah. show them the Guangdong. That's everybody, including the Chinese. Okay. Sit at home for 14 days. If you do that, the issue of discrimination will not be there. But if you are picking all of the Africans, all of the Africans, that is the highest humiliation. Humiliation. That is a very important word, and we're going to come back to that word, but that was Consul General Razak Lawal. That video of him on the streets of Guangzhou went viral very, very quickly, and it was this sense that a Nigerian official was standing up for people. Now, then on April 10th, we had another dramatic moment when the Speaker of the Nigerian House of Representatives summoned Chinese Ambassador Zhou Pingjian to his office and made it very clear he was not happy with what was happening in Guangzhou. Um, how you treat our ambassador is very important, mm. very, very important, mm. and I'm glad you did that. But how you treat our citizens is more important. Uh, I know, yes, yes, yes. How understand. you treat the ambassador. Yes, yes. So, I mean, I just want to, I, I just want to take you, but I'm sure, you know, my, my colleagues will have some comments as well. Mm. I, I, you, are, you said you haven't seen any of the videos that are, that are out there. I'm at liberty to show them to you. Everybody has a mm. phone, if you want, if that will convince you, because you've said you haven't had an official complaint. So he then proceeds to show Ambassador Joe the videos. And there are two remarkable things about this incident. Again, it went viral big and fast. One, that the speaker actually recorded the video and then uploaded it to Twitter that very day. Normally, these type of diplomatic interactions and meetings happen behind closed doors. We, the public, don't get to see them. So and maybe they're recorded on video for record keeping and to make sure that everybody's, you know, saying the right things. 
Uh, but rarely then are they made public. So the fact that the speaker made it public, again, just like with Consul General Lowell, this went viral. And the moment when he confronts the ambassador to see if he has seen any of those videos of the discrimination against Nigerians in Guangzhou was also remarkable because he asked the ambassador, as we just heard, have you seen the videos? And remarkably, the ambassador said, no, he hadn't. And by actually showing him the videos, it revealed one of the key things in this Guangzhou African dilemma was that they were working from two separate sets of data. Chinese officials simply were not following Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, TikTok, all of these different platforms. So they weren't kind of coming to the problem with the same set of information. Okay, let's now move to over the weekend of April 10th, 11th, and 12th. And the momentum starts to change a little bit in this, this discussion, because at that point in early April, if you recall, uh, there was a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. Social media feeds were filled with all of these videos. CNN came out with a really big story produced by Jenny Marsh in the Hong Kong Bureau, uh, really detailing a lot of the discrimination that was happening. And the momentum was clearly that something bad is happening here. But we started to see the first evidence uh, that things started to change over that weekend and the Chinese position started to take shape. Then on April 14th, when Nigerian Foreign Minister Jeffrey Onyema held a press conference with Ambassador Joe, the same Ambassador Joe who was in Speaker Femi's office, uh, the Foreign Minister started to communicate basically China's version of events. We are on top of the situation. I have to um, express our profound gratitude to the Ambassador of China here in Nigeria. He acted immediately and reached uh, the most important uh, uh, elements in the Chinese government hierarchy. Uh, the reaction of the government has been very, very quick. And, um, and, and so they're now working together as a team. Well, let's just say that that press conference did not go down well at all on Nigerian social media and within the Nigerian body politic. Uh, there was outrage across the board. Uh, also, the fact that CGTN and Chinese propaganda really overplayed their hand here. So in that week on that foreign ministry press conference, uh, the Chinese went to town saying, see, the Nigerian foreign minister says there was no discrimination in Africa, and boom, they were hitting it very, very hard. So by the end, just a couple days later, and what was remarkable was Jeffrey Onyema called back Ambassador Joe and had a very different message. You know, uh, an effort to contain uh, an outbreak of uh, COVID-19 Yes, that, uh, you know, uh, some of those that came into the country uh, and tested positive were uh, Africans, but that was absolutely no reason whatsoever to, um, to completely, um, you know, uh, trespass uh, on the rights and uh, the dignity of uh, Nigerians and, uh, and Africans uh, uh, in the city. Well, what a different tone and message. And not surprisingly, uh, CGTN and Chinese propaganda made almost no mention of that press conference. So big contrast just over the course of two or three days. And it gives you a sense of how quickly things have been changing on the ground. Now, from mid-April, from basically the time of that press conference, all the way through towards the end of the month, around the 28th, 29th, things started to calm down. But momentum started to shift now away from Guangzhou, away from the foreign ministry, and to the House of Representatives. On April 29th, Representative Benjamin Kalu uh, introduced a motion to, quote, condemn the maltreatment and xenophobic discrimination against Nigerians in China. And as part of that motion, he wants the immigration status of every Chinese national and business in Nigeria to be checked. Soon after the motion passed, he spoke with Plus TV to explain why he wants to crack down on Chinese illegal immigration. You called for an investigation into the validity of the immigration documents of Chinese citizens in Nigeria. Could you please explain to us exactly what you wish to achieve by this uh, scrutiny? Uh, the time has, uh, what COVID has done is that it's changing the dynamics of a whole lot of things, it's changing the narrative of a whole lot of things, and one of which is it is time we started doing the enumeration of certain things going on in this country that we don't have access to. One of them is information as to the total number of uh, immigrants in our country. 
We are starting with China now because uh, China started with the blacks also, and especially Nigerians in China. We also want to know how many Chinese people are in Nigeria. We want to know the uh, how many of them who are legal in Nigeria. We want to know how many legal businesses operated by Chinese people in Nigeria. And that will help us to know whether they are complying with the dictates of the law establishing the uh, expatriate quota. Are they bringing people to do the job Nigerians are supposed to do? So you can sense that life is starting to get much more difficult in Nigeria for the Chinese. Now, interestingly, the Chinese embassy, who is normally very, very vocal on Twitter, on their website, only responded to Benjamin Kalu's uh, motion on the Chinese version of their website, and they emphasized that said no status has changed. There's been no change in status for any Chinese nationals in Nigeria, and that was basically the end of it. So we haven't heard much from the Chinese side on this. Now, we thought, okay, things are calming down now. That's just the House of Representatives from time to time, just like in other countries, the legislature will say and do things that don't necessarily make it into law. But then in early May, just a few weeks later after uh, Benjamin Kalu's motion, another representative, this time Ben Igbakpa, uh, introduced a different motion that calls for a review of every Chinese loan to Nigeria dating back 20 years. Now, he's concerned that the loans that, that Nigeria has taken out did not have sufficient due diligence and exposes Nigeria to Chinese predatory lending. The Paris Club is crying that the Chinese loans are not Paris Club compliant. IMF is crying that they are not World, um, Paris Club compliant. And if you look at the loans that we have taken so far, one, we cannot justify what we're using them for. These people, they give us their bill of quantity, they give us price, they hold the money, they bring their Chinese people to work in Nigeria. So we are losing on all front. I'm, I cannot sit here and tell you exactly um, what, which of these infrastructures have been religiously uh, um, uh, constructed and completed. And loans are supposed to be project um, uh, dependent. And, and these, these infrastructures, are they really paying for the loan? The one that we've taken, how, what, what is the prudence uh, that we can find in it? How far have we been able to use it? Can we really sit down and say that we are getting value for money? Today, we have about 64,500 Chinese personnel working in Nigeria under this loan. They, cons they, 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 they discuss this loan. The Bureau for Public Procurement does not know anything about this loan. These people are not, um, they don't tend out for this project, which is uh, an aberration and infraction in, in the laws of the land. So that is why Nigerians are crying out. And as legislators, we're looking at it. Let us see uh, what they have done with the work we've collected and why we should collect more. So he's not messing around. I'll stop there for now. There's actually more. I've, I haven't talked at all about what the media coverage has been of all of this, and the media coverage has been very supportive of Benjamin Kalu and Representative Ben Igbakpa. Uh, they've also been very, very emotionally committed to the idea of standing up for Nigerians. Uh, two other quick points, Kobus, before I get your reaction. Uh, there was also crackdowns in both Zamfara and Osun states on illegal Chinese gold mining. Dozens of Chinese have been arrested in the past four to five weeks. Uh, and then on May 12th, two Chinese nationals were arrested for trying to bribe an anti-corruption official. Yes, there is irony in this world, uh, with a hundred million Naira payment. And that was in Sokoto state. So, whew, there's a lot going on, Kobus. In all of your years of studying China-Africa relations, have you ever seen anything like this? Not all of it together, you know. Kind of, there's there's been there's been some pushback on issues. There's been some some calls from governments to to deal with the situation of Africans in China. There's been some crackdowns on illegal mining, that kind of thing, piecemeal in different African countries. But to see it all happening at the same time in a, in what seems to be a more kind of coordinated way, seems to indicate that that Nigeria is, is in some ways taking the China Africa relationship into a new phase. It was a longer setup than we normally do before we get to our guest because I wanted to make sure that those foundational pieces were in place so that when we when we speak to Abdul Ghaffar Tobi Oshodi from the uh, political science department at Lagos State University, uh, we will get some perspective on what it is. So, Tobi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Eric and Kobus. Thank you. You wrote an article for The Conversation that was published back in May 
why maltreatment of Nigerians in China may not end soon. You've heard all the different things that I laid out there in terms of making the case of why the China-Nigeria relationship seems to be at an inflection point. Can you tell us a little bit about, from your point of view in Lagos, what's going on? Uh, thank you, Eric. I think there, there, from the side that you've played, there are several, you know, layers of issues. It is multidimensional, you know. You, you know, you. If you look at those that actually spoke in the soundbite, for instance, you have the speaker, you have the members of representative, you have the speaker. You, I mean, you have the uh, foreign affairs uh, minister. But if you begin to unpack some of these individuals, then you begin to get a clear understanding of the political, the public diplomacy dimension, the economic, and the several other dimensions of what you've just described. Yes, April, you know, marked for those of us that teach China Africa relations or Nigeria China relations, April, April, May this year would forever be in a you know memory and let me just go back to the article you talked about the article in the conversation and that article merely just scratch scratched a little uh, uh, you know dimension of what is currently happening before because if you look at what is happening there is the diplomacy from below you know what what i would describe as diplomacy from below where you see social media propelling politicians to make pronouncements. You can see the Minister for Foreign Affairs. His first pro pronouncement, you know, was a little bit diplomatic, but the second pronouncement had to be more targeted. You know, he was responding to a particular, you know, social media bombardment of the political class. But in the article you referred to, I was actually looking at why this kind of the maltreatment of Nigerians in China won't end. In the article, I actually focused on three things. One is that historically, the maltreatment of Nigerians, broadly Africans in China, is no is no news. You know, it has been happening for several time. And my point is that because it has happened for several times, and China had not been called out, I don't see April May being the end. It will continue to happen. Why, if you look at Chinese investment? The minister had to be diplomatic in his response because if you go to the airport, and if you see one of the uh, members, I think it was ben Kalu, Benjamin Kalu or Ben Igbapa, who was raising questions about Chinese project. Yes, he was more or less playing politics. This, he is a member of the opposition, so that is understood because if he says Chinese project are not you know, he can't see any, he can't pinpoint a Chinese project in Nigeria. Then, of course, he probably won't be passing through the airport. He probably won't be going using the train from Kaduna to Kano. He probably won't be going, traveling on Lagos, Ibadan Expressway, which are clearly Chinese, you know, projects. So, but that aside, because of Chinese investment, the, 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 the minister had to be diplomatic. He had to change his line. As we speak, Nigeria is seeking for loan from China. You know, for, for, for you know, in response to COVID, post-COVID, Nigeria recently asked for 23 billion USD, US dollars. Yes, and yes, 70 over 70 percent of that amount, and that tells you why the minister had to be diplomatic. But of course, he was also pushed, you know, by the public. You know, the social media, the opposition, they were actually, you know, criticizing the government's response to the maltreatment of Nigerians in, in, in China. But underneath that, apart from the Chinese investment in Nigeria, you also have China financing some of the big projects beyond the loan now. We are talking about the airport that I talked about. We are talking about major, you know, roads. The road, for instance, linking Lagos to the West African Corridor is being constructed by the CCECC. That is a Chinese project. So you can understand why the minister was a little bit reluctant. But of course, you can also understand why the opposition, Benny Bakpa and his colleague, were also critical. They were not only critical about 
how the APC, you know, the ruling government has responded to China. But they were also critical about the government's decision to accept Chinese medical doctor, which is another point that you actually did not mention. But m maybe you would also discuss that. No, that was another one. I just ran out of time. But you're absolutely right. The Chinese medical doctors was a, was another issue. Kobus, let's get you into the conversation and, and you know get your point of view on this yeah no i mean it, what's it's it's very interesting for me that all of this is happening you know kind of at this moment um and, and toby i'd like to get your you know to ask you more about that um more specifically i was i wanted to to ask you actually um you know as you mentioned the uh, while the nigerian government is busy with these these sensitive negotiations with china you they're getting a lot of pressure from from opposition parties um d how has um, President Buhari's party actually responded to all of this pressure? I, I, like, is are they kind of keeping a, a unified kind of voice, or is there a diversity of voices around China within the party? Yes, there is. There can't be a unified. They can't have a unified unified response or voice in terms of responding to you know the issue that happened in you know Guangzhou. The reason is the public are actually on their neck. Even members, some of the lower cadres of the ruling party were also critical of the, the, the event. So it would have been difficult, if not impossible, for the government to have, you know, go all out to support China. But like, like, like the, the, the point I said, the, the ruling party, and you know, if you say the ruling party, they're actually layers of the ruling party. You have those, you know, you know in the federal government itself, the president, his ministers. Then you have the House of Representatives, those that are coming from the states. Those, you know, have some kind of, you know, you know, they, they have space to actually criticize government's decision, even if they are from the same party. And those in the National Assembly were actually critical of, you know, some members of the ruling party were actually critical of, you know, the government's slowness to responding to China, China and Africa. So there, there can be, yes, at some level, the government wants to play, the, the ruling party wants to create a kind of unified response. But that is impossible because when the minister was a little bit diplomatic, even members of the ruling party were also critical of, 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 of the minister. So, and that actually made him, you know, rethink and also you know, in a also diplomatic way, criticize the 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 the, 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 the maltreatment of Nigerians in in in, in China. So yes, there, there is no uni you know they don't have a monolithic response in the sense that all members criticized China. The top, the ruling party, the big boys, you know, the ministers, the president will not go all out to criticize China because they need Chinese loan. Yeah, and just to be clear, we have not heard anything from President Buhari on this. So he's kept his distance from all of this, and he's letting yes. the, you know, Jeffrey Onyema and others kind of do the, the, the criticism. Yes, because he can't criticize China. Because if you look since the beginning of the Fourth Republic, which started in Nigeria 1999, when the military actually handed over power to the civilians, virtually all Nigerian leaders have visited China. And that tells you something from Oba Sanjo that was, you know, it, it, there's this popular quote, you know, Oba Sanjo said, if China is going to the moon, please don't forget to take us along. That is the mentality of subsequent ruling, you know, uh, parties. Now, Oba Sanjo's party has lost in 2015, and that led to the emergence of Buhari. But Buhari has also continued with that line, you know, visiting China, exchanging top, you know, level visitations by ministers and the rest of it. So it, 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 it's something that I don't think the president would all of a sudden go public and be critical. And the president also has this style. He hardly he, he, he is not the kind of president that, you know, goes out publicly to make some of this pronouncement. No, he does that to his ministers, his foreign affairs ministers. So I don't expect that in the next few months you see him talking critically about the treatment of China, which is something that is already dying down. It's definitely died down quite a bit. Uh, so let me just understand this, because I'm trying to understand if what we've seen over the past couple of months is really something in the China-Nigeria relationship that the Chinese have to be worried about or should be concerned about, 
that the stability of the relationship is in question, or is this really more about domestic Nigerian politics and China is just a way for the rival parties to, to hit each other? And I, I say this because in the United States, for example, China has been a topic, of particularly around election time, where it's become very contentious. Once the president comes into power, then people calm down a little bit, and the Chinese have gotten used to dealing with that type of criticism. Things have changed now a little bit in the United States. But I guess my question is, should the Chinese embassy and the Chinese foreign ministry in Beijing be worried about what they're seeing, or is this just politics and they'll keep their distance and let this kind of run its course, and then business will go on as usual? I, I, I think business will go on as usual, you know, for a number of reasons. And the reason is this. In a paper, I think 2018, we actually talked about the oscillation of Nigeria-China relations. Oscillation in the sense that it's always moving, you see this instability, but at some point it stabilizes. At some point you get this instability. You know, President Olu Tsegomba Sonjo, for instance, you know, introduced this oil for infrastructure policy, a member of the PDP, the People's Democratic Party. but. His successor came, and within a month, he actually changed that policy into oil for cash. And that tells you, and, but, but over time, I think the China has also understood that in relating with the Nigerian government, they have this expectation of certain level of instability. Yes, the recent instability is more complex. Complex in the sense that it is unlike earlier episodes where you had the instability you know among the ruling elite you know the, the the ruling class but now it is now trickling down into the ordinary people you understand you can now see ordinary people having opinion about china about china in africa so th that is the layer of stability that is not you know the chinese won't i don't think they are actually expecting they, they are not expecting that, and that explains what happened in Ogun State. I was wondering if you could put um, this this current growth of like kind of anti-China sentiment in in Nigeria, in a in a global context. So you know, obviously, you know, there, there's been a lot of skirmishes between between um, Africa and and the Trump administration. But at the same time, I understand that that President Trump has has quite a high approval rating in Nigeria. Um, and so so is there is there a, um, where where does Nigeria fit into, or why does the controversy between Nigeria and China fit into the large a global controversy between the U.S. and China. Uh, yes, I, I, I think on the point that Nigerians have this favorable disposition to uh, President Donald Trump, I think that is really highly debatable. Debatable in the sense that, you know, when he made that pronouncement about African countries being whatever, Nigerians, you know, the media politicians were some of those that actually criticized the president trump for that so I, I think that that is still in the recent memory of most people whether it is in the media and or the the ordinary nigerians so i don't think it is true that nigerians actually prefer a donald trump america to china in fact you know if you look at most of the polls most of the surveys on perception of nigerians and chinese you discover that nigerians tend to be favorably disposed to Chinese and China than to the U.S. And I don't think that has changed. Yes, the recent event will probably, you know, I'm actually waiting for the, 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 this, the, the most recent polls of how Nigerians perceive China. You know, in the last few years, you get up to 70% saying, oh, we, we prefer China as a partner, we like China and the rest of it. But I'm actually waiting for this year's survey to see whether or not that trend that has been happening for some years will change. You know, but now putting it in global perspective, you discover that the U.S. is also a dwindling, you know, power in Nigeria. The U.S. does not really buy our oil, which is the commanding height of our economy. That is what we, you know, our budget is sometimes, you know, pegged at the cost of, you know, the international cost of oil prices. So that tells you how important oil is. But you now see the, the U.S. reducing its reliance on Nigerian oil. So increasingly in re reducing that, China is just having that 
more space you know to demonstrate its you know its 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 ability or you know its its approach of assisting nigeria and that is you know what we are also seeing because if you look at china nigeria relations china beyond the infrastructures that you see beyond the road beyond the airports beyond the railway and the rest of it telecommunications you see a company a chinese company like huawei invested in the universities building in infrastructures giving scholarship to the next generation of nigerian leaders at my university for instance china is building something that may end up being one of the biggest libraries and you, you maybe i should repeat that libraries in the country so i don't think when people see some of these projects they 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 they, they, they want to see the us as doing something better no i don't see it i don't see it from that from from that simple point of view nigeria only exports three percent of its oil to China. So if U.S. oil buying from Nigeria has gone down, which has steadily gone down over the past 10 years as the U.S. has become an oil power itself, uh, but considering the fact that the Chinese don't buy that much Nigerian oil either, why do they have more influence in Nigeria? Is it the soft power initiatives like what you're talking about in terms of building libraries and universities and Huawei, Techno, all of those things? Clearly, clearly. You know, China is not, at some point, even Taiwan was actually buying more oil. I'm, I'm not sure of the year now, was actually buying more oil from Nigeria than China. So that tells you something. But the fact that China, I mean, the U.S. is declining, it does not have that leverage it had before now in telling Nigerian government, you need to do this or we do this. That power of maybe not buying Nigerian oil is dwindling as the American influence you know, is dwindling in, in, in Nigeria gradually. So that, that was the point I was trying to make, that yes, China does not buy a lot of, you know, Nigerian oil compared to maybe Angola or even Sudan. But the point is, it is doing other things that the Chinese, I mean, the Nigerian government consider important. And now the Nigerian government is not only a question about the PDP or APC. Even from the PDP era, China was a useful partner. Now the APC, China is even becoming a more useful partner. Post-COVID, China will become an incredibly useful partner. Already they are asking for loan from China. So that is the context within which I'm saying that the U.S. is not necessarily, you know, it's not a question of Nigeria leaving China for the U.S. No, the U.S. is dwindling in terms of its influence. One of the things that the U.S. did during the military era was to place sanction on you know nigeria especially in terms of buying or not buying the nigerian oil and that was the point where you see american multinational having so much power in the oil sector but now it is no longer you know happening that way because the u.s is not a major destination for nigerian oil that was the point i was trying to make support for this podcast comes from the africa china reporting project at Wits university school of journalism in johannesburg The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at VitsChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. To, to which extent is this this current um, you know tension between Nigeria and China? To which extent can it be seen as Nigeria repositioning itself within Africa, you know, so so taking on a, a kind of a continental leadership position in in relation to China, um, you know, where you know and and in the process kind of reflecting some of the complaints that other countries have in in Africa have had about China. Yes, I, I think that that's um, a question that we've actually been reflecting on for some time. And reflecting on it is just within the context of what, you know, scholars would just refer to as Pax Nigeriana, meaning that Nigeria has this, um, this uh, manifest destiny to be a leader in Africa because of its population, because of its resources, resource endowment and the rest of it. And I think the, the recent event actually is a kind of opportunity for Nigeria in, in, in that sense, meaning that Nigeria, for instance, I understand, played a role in 
mobilizing African ambassadors to, you know, make some kind of complaint to China. Whether or not that was useful is another question entirely. But they actually did did that. But the, the other question is, China, Nigeria, you know, is currently struggling at several fronts. One, there is the Boko Haram conflict that is not only draining the country's resources and its military, you know, you know, men, for instance. But it is also a dent on Pax Nigeriana, the idea that Nigeria can save Africa. If Nigeria cannot, years after, resolve the Boko Haram conflict, it tells you that Nigeria may not be the best, you know, country to assist Somalia with Al-Shabaab. You understand? You can, you can, you can see the point. If, so, so Nigeria is currently being confronted by several challenges. The oil that is being relied upon is also becoming increasingly not a very reliable source of revenue, especially with the fluctuation in international. So to your question, it's, you know, it's still out there. Yes, Nigeria, because of its population, its market, has that potential to really champion, you know, African course in Sino-Africa relations. But because of the local challenges that Nigeria faces and because of its own dependence on China itself, it will be difficult for China to actually, I mean, for Nigeria to actually lead other African countries in engaging China or re-engaging China, if you want. You mentioned oil. The oil that Nigeria depends on to fund its foreign exchange and its, bu its budget, foreign exchange reserves and its budget, is called Bonnie Light Crude. And Bonnie Light was at $57 a barrel last year, and that's what they based the budget on for 2020. Now, this year has been an absolute unmitigated disaster in oil prices, not just because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, but also because of the spat between Russia and Saudi Arabia, which also crashed oil prices because those two went after each other and started producing vast amounts of oil, and the Nigerians couldn't sell anything. So there's this this reckoning that's happening in Nigeria right now about this need to finally get away from oil. And as you, you pointed that out, Toby, one of the areas where Nigeria is stronger than almost anywhere, not just in Africa, but the world, is the emerging tech sector that's there, particularly in Lagos. And the Chinese have played a critical role in this. So we've got companies like Transin, the big mobile phone company that is dominant in Nigeria, dominant in Africa. We also have Opay, which is very, very big in Nigeria. Boomplay, 62 million customers, very big in West Africa, particularly in Nigeria. Uh, Star Times, also very strong in Nigeria. And last year, one of the big talking points, if you listen to our show, we looked at all of this rush of Chinese venture capital coming into where? Uh, Nigeria in part because Nigeria is the largest domestic African market. So the idea you got a couple hundred million consumers ready-made, you can hit them right there. Whereas the rest of Africa, much like here in ASEAN, is a patchwork and requires a lot more strategy. Now with COVID-19 and the debt write-offs coming, Toby, one of the theories that's out there is that the Chinese will not have the appetite to spend huge amounts of money anymore on these 17, 18 billion dollar infrastructure and loan packages, but they will encourage their private sector companies to go. And if they go, they're gonna come to Nigeria. Talk to us a little bit about the role of Chinese private sector, particularly in the tech sector in Nigeria. The, the tech sector in Nigeria is actually interesting. Interesting because the youth population in Nigeria, like many African countries, you know, is a market for technology. You know, people want to do whatever. They want to go online. They want to, you know, they want to get taxi file. They want to do things on their mobile phone. So that 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 is actually a a sector that would, you know, that owes so much potential in future. But be the, the tech sec sector tech you know sector. We also need to be careful about that sector. In the sense that, while it holds so much potential, COVID or post-COVID has demonstrated to us that rather than technology, what we also need to be looking at more seriously is agriculture. Agriculture, which Chinese private companies are not necessarily too, you know, too visible. Even the tech, you can actually you know, you can, it's not as if Chinese tech companies are actually 
mo so much that you know you get uh, you know they, they've dominated the sector no you, you don't see an alibaba for instance in in in, in lagos in lagos competing with Kunga or the rest of it. No, it hasn't gotten to that 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 state. But like you you hinted, the tech sector is an opportunity that Chinese private companies can actually explore for that. You know, in the post oil, you know, era in 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 Nigeria. But in doing that, the Nigerian government is also conscious of the need for agriculture, and they are, they've also said that. So, Chinese private, you know investment may actually be looking also at agriculture which is something that is you know coming to to, to you know to steer the political class that imagine a scenario where you are to close your borders for months what if the current regime had not introduced the rice the local rice production which you have a lot of nigerian companies investing in what if they'd not done that what would have happened to the importation of rice, which would have been logged out for some months now. So I, I think that is the area that I act, actually imagine that maybe in future, the Chinese private enterprises may actually be looking at, along with the technology con, uh, uh, you know, sector. But it is not as if the chi China has actually dominated or is you know, too visible in the technology sector. Yes, you have start times. But just as you have start times, you have DSTV, which is still to a very large extent, leading start times in terms of, you know, its market and, you know, its 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 market, its its kind of consumer, you know, numbers. So, so th 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 that is my view. Let's wrap up our discussion now, and we're very grateful for the time that you took with us today. And I know you're very busy, so I want to let you get back to your day. I want to ask kind of looking forward. Now, I honestly thought that this conversation that we're having today was going to go in a very different direction. I thought based on what we've been seeing over the past two months that you were going to be much more pessimistic about the China-Africa relationship and the China-Nigeria relationship. Uh, I thought you were going, especially because you wrote an article that says why the maltreatment of Nigerians in China may not end soon. And yet, you're much more sanguine about it. So I'd like you to kind of give our listeners and give us a view of what we should expect in the next, say, near term and medium term as to where you think this relationship is going, specifically about those issues in the House of Representatives, where those seem very serious motions. And uh, and I just would like to get our get your take on what you see in the in the short term ahead. Yes, in, in the short term, I think things would normalize, you know, depending on what happens afterwards, things would normalize. But like I started, I said there are two layers. One is the layers, you know, among the political class. Then the other layers, which, you know, I think China also needs to be, and that was the old point about the article in the conversation, that China needs to begin to seriously think about. It is at the level of the ordinary Nigerians and the ordinary Chinese citizens in Nigeria. You get this kind of maltreatment, news of maltreatment happening in China being reported, it will still be in the social media for years to come. People would see and interact, they will make sense of it, they connect it to future events, they connect it to past events. So depending on what happens in terms of how China, and one interesting thing is that when China decided to send its medical doctors and you know some of the support staff to Nigeria, China was seriously criticized, but you, you, one, thing about, one, one thing that was for me interesting was that instead of taking its citizens and taking them out, the citizen, it allowed the citizens to be, you know, several criticisms, some insults, you know, you get the opposition challenging why the government should go ahead to bring, you know, doctors from a country that is reported to have been the source of the COVID, you know, you know the co coronavirus into china but china was just sinking in and the chinese doctors were just yes when they, when they got to nigeria they also you know were silent they were not going publicly they were not going for the no there was no time for that picture you know snapping but they understood they understood that things happened but in spite of that they did not want that to affect the long-term relationship and that is the point China understands that Nigeria is an important player in the continent. And because of that, 
it wants to amend, make amend for whatever it did or not do in Guangzhou. And I think China would also continue along that line. And I think because the Nigerian government is also relying on China for loan, for project financing, and for investment, it becomes quite diff tricky for any Nigerian government to be too critical of China. So in the long run, if China continues to grow, Nigeria continues to need this infrastructure to propel its own or fast track its own development, it will continue to need China. So in the long run, I foresee a kind of, yes, it will still be the normal oscillation in relationship. There will be some pockets of instability. But in the long run, I think China-African relations, I mean, China-Nigeria relations would stabilize and probably, you know, continue the way it has been for some time. But then when we begin to get all these episodes of maltreatment, you know, of Nigerians, whether in China or in Chinese company in Nigeria, it will continue to add to this, you know, anti-Chinese sentiment. And I don't know whether or not that would key into the politics. Key into the politics meaning that China and Chinese in Africa, in Nigeria, will become an election issue. It has not gotten to that stage, unlike in Zambia. It has not gotten to the point where China in Nigeria becomes, or the Chinese treatment of Nigerians, whether in China or in Nigeria, becomes a, 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 a talking point for election. No, it has not gotten to that time. But it could, depending on what happens in terms of Nigeria-China relations, at the ordinary people's level going forward. Abdul Ghaffar Tobi Oshodi is on the faculty of the Political Science Department at Lagos State University. He's been a longtime scholar of China-Nigeria relations. I really recommend that you look him up. Uh, Why Maltreatment of Nigerians in China May Not End Soon is an excellent article on the conversation that he recently wrote. Uh, Toby, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights. You really changed my outlook on this story. And I'm sure probably a lot of people feel the same. If people want to stay in touch with you and follow what you're reading and writing these days, uh, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Um, well, I think oh, I am trying to learn Twitter. I, I'm a little bit reluctant about using Twitter, but I've been forced to say, oh, you have to do Twitter nowadays if you want to get things out there as fast as possible. So on Twitter, at Toby Oshodi. That's, that's my uh, Twitter handle. We'll put a link to Twitter Everybody, please be nice with Toby. He's new on Twitter. We want him to stay on Twitter. So uh, please handle with, with, with delicate gloves. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, your insights were absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Kobus, Toby brought up two very, very important points that I often make in my discussions about China, Africa, with people who are new to the topic. And he really did an excellent job in grounding me in the importance of this. Number one. What you see on social media does not necessarily reflect what happens at the elite governing class level. So there is a huge you know, divergence in African societies and increasingly now in non-African societies. In Europe and the U.S. we're seeing the same thing. So people oftentimes will make the conclusion that because there is a lot of hostility towards China on social media and in the press and in civil society, that means that the broader China-Africa, or in this case, China-Nigeria relationship, is in trouble. And I think one of the clear messages from him was the fact that between Buhari and the governing elites in Nigeria and the governing elites in China, everything is pretty darn good and very, very stable. And I think it's really important to separate those two. The other kind of key point that he made, which I think is absolutely critical, is that China now is increasingly becoming a domestic political issue. And it's so, again, it's hard to kind of separate what is an international relations issue and what is just pure domestic politics between rival politicians and rival political parties. He mentioned Zambia. This is also the case in uh, South Africa to some extent, and certainly in Kenya, where China is a hot potato political issue. So for us as outside observers, we have to separate out what is really about China and what is really about hitting the governing or ruling party or the governing incumbents 
uh, over the head with a stick and China just happens to be a convenient stick to use. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that that's true for, for places like the United States as well, you know, kind of where, where China is increasingly becoming a kind of a, a domestic political issue, you know, a talking point in the election. And I think it's a reflection of, of obviously, of China's um, growing role in the world, um, you know, that, that it is having this kind of impact everywhere. What was also very interesting for me in his discussion is the way that Nigeria is positioning itself in relation to Africa. You know, this this kind of narrative of Nigeria having a, a, a natural leading position in Africa is, is a very interesting one. Um, and, you know, kind of Nigeria has, has in, the, in the past had somewhat chilly relationships with South Africa, I think probably around some of these issues. Um, it'll be very, very interesting to see how, how post-COVID, um, you know, kind of how, how it shakes out on the continent, you know, kind of like who steps into a leadership position and whether the idea of a, of a continental leadership position even makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that is that is absolutely fascinating, in part because of Nigeria's economy and domestic market makes it very, very attractive because outside brands, and we've been seeing this a lot from Chinese companies, want to come into the African market. Where is the first stop for them? Traditionally, it may have been South Africa because of the stability of the economy, the legal system. Uh, Kobus, your country is in deep recession now. Uh, it's been downgraded by Moody's. Uh, consumers are, are, are kind of stretched very thin, and it doesn't have the size of the domestic market that Nigeria has. So I think in the future, we're going to see this draw of Chinese companies auto manufacturers, technology companies, agriculture, pharmaceutical, so many different companies are going to look for new markets in part because their own domestic market is slow. China is now in recession itself. And so as they go abroad, Nigeria may be the place they stop off first. And it may not even be an Africa strategy. It might just be a Nigeria strategy because that's big enough to sustain uh, you know, the early stages uh, of growth. So I think that's something very interesting. Again, I just want to close on, on the point that I made in my final question to Toby about how, you know, it's humbling for me to, who's been doing this for 10 years, to think that I, I've got this story figured out. I kind of know what's going on. And I really thought when we started the show that he was going to come out and say, China's in trouble in Nigeria, that China really is facing a challenge that they've never faced before. In fact, you and I thought, this is unprecedented. And in fact, what he said is he reaffirmed what we've always known about the China-Africa relationship, is that the good and the bad sit side by side. He said the word oscillate, I've used cyclical. It goes through these waves of hostility, engagement, friendship, hostility, engagement, friendship. And we're in a particularly difficult moment now on one level, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the entire relationship is jeopardized. Because as he pointed out, it's highly compartmentalized. Civil society versus governing elites, corporate versus state-funded, Exim Bank, all of these different things operate in dis different spheres. And I think it's easy for outsiders to look at one or two of the things that are going on and come to conclusions to say, oh, well, you see, China's in trouble in Nigeria. And I'll admit, that was what I was doing at the beginning of the show. I am humbled and reformed about doing that by the end of the program. Yeah, and I mean, this is this is also true for I think for for you know other actors who want to gain influence in Africa or interested or is worried about Chinese influence in Africa, like you know Western actors, for example. It's easy to think, oh, you know, China's toast, you know, in in in, in Nigeria and elsewhere. Um, you know, it's 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 one thing to have China weather the you know a set of controversies. It's another thing to 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 actually fundamentally you know see a deterioration of the actual relationship. Um, you know, that, that will take a lot more, I think. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion. We do this every week. We've been doing it for 10 years now. Coming up this fall, we'll be coming up on our 500th episode. If you're listening, interested in listening to some of our back episodes, the archives are all available on our website at ChinaAfricaProject.com. You can't find it on iTunes. iTunes only, I think, stores the last 100 episodes. So if you want to go back, and if, particularly if you're a researcher or if you're an analyst or you're just interested in the topic and want to see kind of the pro progression of the relationship, uh, Kobus and I have been doing this for 10 years, so we're very excited about it. Uh, also for the fact that we do a daily email newsletter, and we would love for you to join our community of readers every day. Uh, folks like Toby receive it. Uh, it goes to academics, analysts, intelligence operatives, diplomats, corporate, venture capitalists. They're all getting it every day. We would love for you to be part of this conversation. Just go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. It's half off for students and scholars. 
And by the way, a little Easter egg at the end of the show. If you use the promo code podcast, we're going to wipe off a third of the price. It'll just be $99 a year. So use the promo code podcast at checkout and we'll take off a third right off the top. So from $149 down to $99, it's a little secret we put at the end of the show just to see who is paying attention and who gets all the way to the end. So our little present to you, our most loyal listeners. Uh, That'll do it. Copus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the show. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.